Okay, let's try some difficult logarithmic problems. So for the first one, let's say we have log base a of b is equal to x squared, and log base b of a is equal to 8x. And we're asked, what is x? How can we solve this? Well, in each scenario, I want to change these to exponents. I think that might be the best way to go about it. So on the left here, you could say a to the exponent x squared is equal to b. And on the right, you could say that b to the exponent 8x is equal to a, right? Just go around the horn. That's how you do this, right? b to the 8x equals a, right? We know how to do that at this point, hopefully. So now that they're both in exponential form, we can do some substitution, right? I could say maybe plug the definition for a, so the b8x, into this a over here, right? If you do that, you'll have b to the 8x to the exponent of x squared equals b. Well, this b is just to the exponent 1, right? So once you simplify this exponent over here, b to the 8x cubed, right, because x times x squared is x cubed, and you say that's equal to b1, all of a sudden you have like bases, you can equate the exponents, right? So you get 8x cubed equals 1, and then you solve for x. Divide both sides by 8, x cubed is equal to an eighth. Cube root both sides, and you're going to get x is equal to a half. So that was a neat little question, right? There's a little bit of a trick to it. You had to figure out where to start, but then once you're on your way, you're able to get the answer, no problem, right? Let's do another one. Let's say we have to solve for x, and the question is log base 2 square root x plus log base 4 of x is equal to 5. Now, it looks like you want to use the product rule. That would be the instinct, but unfortunately you can't because these bases are different, right? Bases need to be the same to use a product rule. And so we can't do that. I'm going to try something else. I want to look at this thing by itself and then this thing by itself. So I'm going to say this is equal to a, and I'm going to say this is equal to b. So if this first one's equal to a, I could rewrite that as an exponential. I could say 2 to the a equals the square root of x. And for this one, I could do the same thing. I could say 4 to the b is equal to x, right? Now on the left here, I'm saying that 2a equals x to the 1 half, right? Because that's what the square root is. And over here, what I really have is 2 squared to the b, or 2 to the 2b is equal to x. And you could solve for 2 to the b, right? You could get rid of that 2, and you would get 2 to the b equals, you square root both sides to get rid of it, you'd get x to the 1 half, right? Well, if 2 to the a is equal to x to the 1 half, and 2 to the b is equal to x to the 1 half, that means that 2a must equal 2b, right? Which, if 2 to the a equals 2 to the b, then a must equal b. Ah, that's interesting. So if a and b are equal to each other, and a and b are these two things, then this thing and this thing must equal each other. Okay, interesting. If these two things are the same, if this is equal to this, and they add up to 5, then they must both be half of 5, right? Like if something plus something equals 5, and they're equal to each other, they both must be half of 5, right? It's the only way for that to work. Meaning that a, the first term, has to equal 2.5, and b, the second term, is also equal to 2.5, right? And so the way to solve for x would be just take either of those, right, either the log base 2 of the square root of x or the log base 4 of x, and set it equal to 2.5, right? So you could say log base 2 of the square root of x is equal to 2.5, or you could say log base 4 of x equals 2.5, and just solve for x in either case, and you'll get the same answer, right? So if you do it on the left here, you have log base 2 of x to the 1 half equals 2.5. Rewrite that as an exponent. 2 to the 2.5 equals x to the 1 half, right? Square both sides to get rid of that. So those cancel x is equal to 2 to the exponent 5, which is going to be 32. So you get x equals 32. You could also solve it over here. You could say 4 to the 2.5 is equal to x. If you try to figure out what that is, that's just 4 to the 5 over 2. You could rewrite that as a fraction if you want, or you could just punch it into your calculator, right? Either way. But 4 to the 
5 over 2. Well, 4 to the 1 half is 2, so really what you have here is 2 to the 5, which of course is also 32. So you get 32 regardless of which way you choose to solve it. You're going to get the right answer. Okay, so hopefully that made sense. Let's do another one. Let's say you're told you have to prove the following. You have to prove that log base 1 over n of 1 over b is equal to log base n of b. All right, and then you're also told the fact that b has to be bigger than 0, n has to be bigger than 0, and n cannot equal 1. Because if that happens, this all gets a little bit funny, right? Like if n is 0, you know, you can't divide by 0. You know, you can't have a base of 0. You don't want n to be 1 because you don't want a base of 1, right? You don't want b to be, you know, less than 0 or 0 because you can't have a negative there. You can't divide by 0. Same idea, right? So this is just making sure that nothing funny happens. But still, we want to prove that this is true, right? So how could we do this? Well, first what I would do is I would try to rewrite what we have here a little bit. Um, I would say that 1 over n to the exponent of this thing is equal to this, right? 1 over n to the exponent log nb is equal to 1 over b. That's what I would start with, change this to an exponential. Now, once you get to here, you could change that 1 over n to n to the negative 1 to the log nb equals 1 over b, because then that could become n to the exponent negative log nb equals 1 over b. You could take that negative that's on the front of your log, and you could move it into the exponent on the b, right? That's your power rule. So you could say n to the exponent log n b to the negative 1 is equal to 1 over b. And now if you recall that logarithmic rule that we touched on when we went over all the rules that said that a number to the exponent of log base that number of a number, those things can cancel. And you're left with b to the negative 1 equals 1 over b, which that's true, right? 1 over b equals 1 over b. That's what negative 1 is, right? So that's our proof, right? We just proved that the original statement given to us is correct, right? And that's it. Now there are other ways you could do this obviously, and I would encourage you to go and try and find some different methods, or maybe you had something else in mind, try that and see if yours works as well, okay? Um, let's do another question. So this one says, show that if log base square root of b of a, is equal to c, and log base d of square root b is equal to c, that log base d of a is equal to c squared. Now this is a doozy, right? You might not know where to start with this one. So they're saying that log base square root b of a is equal to c, log base d of square root b is also equal to c, and then log base d of a is equal to c squared. So that's interesting, right? So what I would do is I would start rewriting some of these as exponents. So I'd start with this one, and I would say square root b to the c is equal to a, right? And that would mean that square root b is equal to a to the exponent 1 over c, right? Bring that over there. And then for this one, you could say that d to the c equals square root b. And so now because this here, you know, this thing on the right is equal to root b, and down here, this thing on the left is equal to root b, therefore those must equal each other, right? d to the exponent c must equal a to the exponent 1 over c, right? And if you raise both sides to the exponent c, c and c, those cancel, you're left with a is equal to d to the exponent of c squared, like that, right? So a is equal to d to the c squared. So what can I do with that information? Well, you could rewrite that. You could show that log base d of a is equal to c squared. Because if you go around the horn, d to the c squared equals a, right? So I just changed this exponential into a logarithmic statement. That's all I did. Now that is equal, right, this, that's the same as your third statement, right? This thing that you were trying to prove. So given that these two things are true, the first two, 
we're able to show that the third one was true. Now again, that's probably not the only way to do this, and I encourage you to look for other methods, but this is the way that I found. Let's do another one. Um, and for this one, we're just going to solve for x. So we have log base 4 of log base 5 of x is equal to a half. So it's not log 4 of something times another log, it's log base 4 of log base 5 of x, and that's equal to a half. So what I'll do first is rewrite this as an exponential. So 4 to the exponent of a half is equal to log base 5 of x, right? So just go around the horn. 4 to the 1 half equals this, right? That's all I did. Um, from there, you can even simplify the 4 to the 1 half to be 2, because that's just square root of 4. So 2 equals log base 5 of x. And then from there, you can rewrite this as an exponential again, right? Go around the horn. 5 to the 2 equals x, right? So 5 to the 2 equals x. Therefore, 25 is equal to x. That's your final answer. So this one looked tricky, right? Because it was a log within a log. But all you do is you go around the horn twice. You put it into an exponential two times. And that's enough to get your answer, right? That's enough to isolate x. Okay. Blue jeans fade when washed, with each wash removing 2.2% of the dye. How many washings are needed to give a pair of jeans a well-worn look, with about 30% of the original dye remaining? Okay. So we want to figure out essentially how many washes are needed to reduce from 100% dye to 30%, right? That's the idea. So to do this, we're going to set up uh, an exponential equation, right? We'll say we want 30, that's kind of your future value, and you start with 100, right? Because you have 100% of the dye at the start. Now we're going to have 1 minus the percent, right, which is 2.2, so 0 0.022. We have to write that as a decimal to the exponent of x, where x is the number of washes, okay? So very similar setup to, you know, a population question or an investment question. So we solve for x. Um, first, I'll divide both sides by 100, and you get 0 0.3 equals, um, you can simplify what's in here, and you'll get 0 0.978 to the x. And now we have to solve for x. So I'll take the log of both sides, log of 0 0.3 equals log of 0 0.978 to the x, and then you can bring the x to the front, right? So you put the x on the front, and it's no longer there. Then you divide both sides by log of 0.978. So you get x is equal to log of 0 0.3 divided by log of 0 0.978. And that is going to equal approximately 54 washes, right? At this step, you want to use your calculator, right? And again, when I write down log, I'm using a base of 10. I'm just not writing it down, right? Because that's the standard. Okay. A car depreciates in value by 20% a year. The value of a $30,000 car over time is modeled by the function V equals 30,000 times 0.8 to the T, where T is the time in years. How many years will it take for the car to be worth half the original value? So half the original value, that means it'll be worth $15,000. So 15,000 equals 30,000 times 0 0.8. That represents a 20% decrease a year, right? We could have come up with this equation if we needed to, but they gave it to us. And that's to the exponent t. So let's solve for t. So we're going to divide both sides by 30,000, and you get 1 half equals 0 0.8 to the t. And it makes sense that you get a half here, because it's going to be half of the original value, right? So now we just have to solve for t. Same process as last time. You can take the logarithm of both sides. So log of a half equals log of 0 0.8, move the t to the front, just like that from up here, right? Divide both sides by log of 0 0.8, so t equals log of a half divided by log of 0 0.8, and if you calculate that, you're going to get 3.1 years, approximately. Okay, let's do another. This will be the last question. A culture of mold growth is modeled by the function m at t equals 4 times 7.07 .07 to the t where m is the total number of spores and t is the time in hours. How many hours will it take to have 531 spores? So mold grows pretty quickly, right? And this is just representing the growth of the mold, right? So what we can do is we can plug in 531 for m, right, the number of spores. So we'll have 531 equals 4, which is what we started with, times 7.07 .07 to the t. So we're growing very, very quickly, right? over 
is the growth rate, you know, every hour. So we start with four, we end up with 531. Let's see how long that takes. I have a feeling it'll be surprisingly short. So let's divide both sides by four. Um, you'll have, if you do 531 divided by four, you get 132.75 is equal to 7.07 .07 to the T. Same idea, take the log of both sides. If you want, you can use natural log. We don't really use that that often, so let's do that instead. So just LN, same process though. Bring down the T, T ln 7.07 .07 times ln of 132.75. Uh, to get T by itself, divide both sides by ln of 7.07. .07. So we have ln of 132.75 divided by ln of 7.07. .07. And if you calculate that, that's just gonna equal 2.5 hours. So like I said, it doesn't take very long to go from four spores to 531 when we're talking about mold. Okay, and that's it.